Well, good morning, everyone. It's still by 17 minutes. Guys, it's fantastic to be with you here today. Sunny, thank you so much for the handover, James. Fantastic. Nicola, the Century Suite looks absolutely incredible. And again, thank you to the comms team. You guys are doing an amazing job. They're doing an incredible job, aren't they? Making this thing run. It's fantastic. So I'm, honestly, I'm just so excited to be with all of you here today um, as we talk again about this, this, uh, this, this word unshakable, right? And so we're looking in the book of 1 Peter uh, as we do this, and we're talking about God's unshakable kingdom and different, different aspects that that brings. Um, and so I'd like to start just by uh, taking us back in the Bible to a period just before Jesus' death during the Passover festival, because we see this incredible interaction that you may have heard of before, um, but I'll just reiterate it for you, because Jesus was there and he was with his disciples and he turned to Peter. Um, now, Peter had been with him for a long time. They were good friends, one of his closest kind of disciples. And he turned to Peter and he said, Peter, I'm going to wash your feet. Now, Peter tried to put up a massive fight. He was like, no, Jesus, I'm, you're, not, you're not doing it. I'm not going to allow you to do it. We're, we're, not, we're not doing that. That's, that's something that is reserved for the servants. That's something that's reserved for people that are, that are normally kind of like less than me. I'm not going to let somebody that's higher than me, my teacher, my leader, wash my feet. No, we're not going to do that. But Jesus persisted and he explained to Peter that what he was about to do was crucial to Peter's understanding of, of the kingdom of God. It was crucial to him understanding it. It was then that he proceeded to wash not only Peter's feet, but the feet of all of the other disciples that were there with him. See, Jesus set an example for Peter, the disciples, and for even all of us here today who would read these words and, and read that this happened, that if he, Jesus, the Son of God, their Lord, their teacher, their leader, had bowed and humbled himself to serve them by washing their feet, then what he was saying is that if I can do it, then you can do it as well. You can take this same attitude and do it for each other and do it for people all across the world. Jesus was showing Peter, as he did many times, that the life of a Jesus follower was completely different to the lives of everybody else on the earth. He was flipping the script to see that in God's kingdom, greatness isn't seen in how many people you have serving you. Greatness is seen in your heart and ability to serve others. That's the definition of greatness in God's kingdom. And so it was experiences like these that shaped Peter's whole understanding of what the kingdom of God was about, about uh, the values that were in the kingdom of God. And so it's, um, it's, it's there that we turn to 1 Peter 5, verse 5, and I'd encourage you to read along with me to, to turn and find it in your Bibles. And we're going to read a couple of verses. I encourage you to highlight bits that stick out to you, underline bits, make notes, bookmark, whatever you've got to do to, to, to place it right in front of you. And so in 1 Peter 5, verse 5, Peter says this, and he's talking to a church. He says, look, all of you clothe yourselves with humility toward one another. Because God opposes the proud, but shows favour to the humble. You see, as Peter was doing this, he was quoting from uh, what, in essence, was his Bible. He was quoting from the book of Proverbs in the same way that, like a preacher, if they're going to make a point, they might use, you know, whether they should use the Bible to really, like, you know, be a grounding for what they're saying. Peter did that same thing. And so he quoted from the book of Proverbs, and he quoted from Proverbs 3, verse 34, which says this. It says, uh, he, talking about God, he mocks proud mockers, but shows favour to the humble and the oppressed. So this is, this is massive because God actively opposes people that are proud. People that are self-interested and people that think of themselves higher than they should. God isn't just uninterested in them. He's not just like not bothered about them. No, he actively opposes the proud. People like that. And so, you know, when we talk about what pride is, I'm sure that all of us here can probably kind of, maybe our mind just goes straight to someone. And maybe there's someone that you know that you're like, oh, when I think of pride or, you know, that, then, then my mind goes to this person. Well, let me just encourage you just a second. I know you might not be in church. You've not got people around you that can overhear your conversations, but God says he's with you by your spirit right now. So just ask yourself, should I say this if, would I say this if Jesus was right next to me? You know, <laughs> so look, before we kind of like build up someone as like, oh, this is, this is what it means to kind of like be proud and stuff. Personally, I think the pride is far more subtle than you think and actually affects all of us way more than we give it 
credit for. Because pride is ultimately the unhealthy focus on self. It doesn't mean that you're walking around with a mirror all the time, but pride is the, is the unhealthy desire to self-preserve and the unhealthy desire to self-elevate. And so what does pride look like? Well, in a very kind of like subtle and, and common sense, pride probably looks a bit like this. Pride looks like our stubbornness when we avoid taking advice from people around us because maybe we just think they don't know what they're talking about or maybe they're you know, underneath us or something like that in the, in the, in the workplace. And so we avoid taking advice. That, that's pride. Pride looks like the need and the, the pursuit to always be right. We can't be wrong. Or we definitely don't want to be seen to be wrong. That's pride. Pride looks like always having to have the last word in a discussion or an argument. Maybe you've been there. That's pride. Pride looks like putting other people down because ultimately it makes you feel better or makes you look better. Pride is the need to make ourselves look good so that people around us will think better about ourselves. This is what pride looks like on a daily and more common kind of way. Pride ultimately is about me, 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 making ourselves look better and the people around us look smaller. See, when Jesus teaches, he teaches us that there's, there's no room for pride in the kingdom of God. No, there's no room. And it's, it's funny, like when I was preparing for this, my mind went straight to the narrow gate that Jesus spoke about. You know, he said that the entrance to the kingdom of God is through a narrow gate. And in a, in a way, you know, the way I like to think about it is it's, it's a narrow gate because if your head is too big because you're too proud, you can't fit through the gate, you know. That's what it's like. There's no room for pride in the kingdom of God. You see, this is because when we truly see God, when you get a real picture and a vision of God, you see how amazing he is, how worthy of your worship and praise that he is, how great God really is. We really see that there is no comparison between us and God. It's like the difference between comparing the light that comes from a lit match and the fire of the burning sun. It's just, there's like no comparison, you know? There's no comparison. C.S. Lewis said this, and I find it so helpful when I think about this. He said that in God, you come up against something which is in every respect immeasurably superior to yourself. And unless you know God as that, immeasurably superior, unless you know God as that, and therefore know yourself as nothing in comparison, then you do not know God at all. As long as you are proud, you cannot know God. Because a proud man is always looking down on things and people. And of course, as long as you are looking down, you cannot see something that is above you. See, when we understand that we were all so desperately lost in sin, so desperately lost in our own mess, that nothing could bring us out of that except for the grace of God, then that does something to you. When you understand your life was dependent on God's grace, your life is dependent on the death of Jesus, it wouldn't have happened any other way. That does something inside of you. It, it, it humbles us. See, we realise how truly incapable we are at bringing ourselves up. You see, God didn't need us, but we did need God. We needed him. So I, I like to think that throughout life as we empty ourselves of self, when we empty ourselves of thinking about ourselves, it's in that place that God can then come and fill that space. You see, Jesus said lots about this. He said in, in Matthew 23 that those who exalt themselves, those that are proud, those who exalt themselves will ultimately be humbled, but those who humble themselves will be exalted. Or in Mark chapter 10, Jesus said this, whoever wants to become great among you must be a servant and whoever wants to be first must be a slave of all for even the son of man did not come to be served but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many you see Jesus whole life was characterized by service his whole life was characterized by putting people around him first and before himself you see I believe Jesus is the clearest example of humility that we have 
without any extra motive or attitude mixed in, he provides the clearest template for what a humble life looks like. And it's funny, when we think about the way that Jesus, um, you know, kind of like acted and the things that he said, and we even think about kind of, okay, what does it mean that Jesus was humble then? Um, I think that sometimes we can get into this little bit of a, of a mix-up because you notice when we see the things that Jesus said, we see that Jesus never speaks badly about himself. He's never kind of like trying to make himself less than he is or trying to uh, make himself look bad or put himself down in front of people because ultimately Jesus knew who he was. He knew who he was. And so if he, if he lied about who he was, then he, he wouldn't be Jesus. No, like, let me give you an example. In Matthew 28, Jesus said this. He said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. You see, these, these words are not the words of someone that's trying to put themselves down. No, Jesus was honest and upfront about his power. He was honest about his ability to give peace to people. He was honest about his, his worthiness of worship and praise. Because in the words of C.S. Lewis, true humility is not thinking less of yourself, but it's in thinking less, thinking of yourself less. Let me say that again, I must have. He said, true humility is not thinking less of yourself, but it's thinking of yourself less. Now, this is a battle, I know, on both sides for lots of people. You know, we think that being humble means that I need to, like, downplay myself. I need to squash myself. I need to put myself down to make myself smaller. But that's not what humility is. That's having low self-esteem. And having low self-esteem is not the same thing as being humble. You see, I think if we're honest, this is something that many of us have probably battled with throughout life and probably still battle with today, to view ourselves as less than we really are. Now, I know for lots of us, you know, all of our journeys are different and this could have been caused by any number of things. Um, You know, maybe for some of us, it was a case of like, you know, our upbringing and maybe as children, we were told things um, that have stuck with us. You know, we were told messages by parents, friends, people that bullied us, teachers, And they said things that then caused us to have a view of ourselves so that we have really low self-esteem. We put ourselves down. Maybe for some of us, it was certain experiences that have shaped us. You know, perhaps some of us have gone through kind of trauma that has really kind of shaped the way that we see ourselves. And we just want to put ourselves down and think of ourselves as less um, all the time. You know, maybe for some of us, it's simply that we just can't live up to the expectations of the people around us. And we find ourselves constantly slipping and not meeting those expectations. And so again, we put ourselves down and our esteem goes low. It's a horrible place to be. You see, living with a low self-esteem, constantly going through life, just putting ourselves down and trying to squash ourselves and make ourselves small, isn't healthy and actually doesn't make us more spiritual if, that, if that's the goal, if that's what we're trying to do. You see, the Bible gives a very different message to those messages that maybe we were told as children or that people around us have told. See, the Bible instead places an incredibly high value on you. In the Bible, it says that God cares about you so much that he would send his only son to die for you. That's how much he cares about you and loves you. That's how precious you are to him. The Bible says that God took so much care, meticulous detail in designing you so that you exactly the way that he wanted you to be. Not only that, but God says, look, you are so crucial to the kingdom of God's expansion that I'm going to put my spirit inside of you. You're going to have power when the spirit comes inside of you and you have a plan and a purpose that doesn't exist for anybody else. It's your plan and purpose and I'm going to do incredible things for for you. See, the Bible plays a completely different picture. You see, low self-esteem limits us. We create limit for ourselves when we have low self-esteem. You see, when we have low self-esteem, we hold back from taking on new challenges. We shy away from difficult situations because we don't believe that we're cut out to do it. We put limits on what we believe God is able to do through us because we see ourselves like that. You see, when we talk about humility and especially especially the, the, the Bible's definition of humility, it's completely different to what we would describe as low self-esteem. See, where low self-esteem creates limits and limits us from doing things, I believe that humility frees us from those limits. 
when we embrace true Christian humility, we embrace the incredible position that we are in as children of God. And we can now go out and live this radical, incredible life and plan that God has for us, knowing that he is with us and working through us all the way by his power. So you see, Jesus was the incredible example of this. He served and he gave up everything that he had in order to lift other people up. It would cost him his time. It cost him his dignity at points. It cost him the risk of other people making fun of him or or, or looking down on him. And ultimately, we read, it cost him his life. All so that he could lift other people up that needed lifting. So he could lift people that society had written off. People that were hated and spat on. People that were classed as the lowest of the low. Thinking of others, Jesus just gave and he gave and he gave and he gave. All so that he could lift other people up. You see, this is the Christian model of humility. This is what humility is. First, having an accurate and clear, life-changing vision of God and understanding God in all of his greatness and, and the fact that he has, you know, wants to have a relationship with us. And then from there, in light of that, choosing to give to other people, to whoever it is around us, in light of everything that God has given us. I remember the first time I attended the maturity class here at um, MKCC, many probably about seven or eight years ago. I remember the first time doing it, and I can remember sitting there as Billy unpacked, um, you know, God's plan for discipleship in our lives and how He was going to help us to grow and to become more like Jesus. And I could, there's always this phrase that stuck out to me um, that I just love, and He said that we are never more like Jesus, or we are most like Jesus when we are giving. That's when we're most like Jesus. We're most like God, we're most like Jesus when we give, when we serve. See, to be more like Jesus means to be more giving, to seek to build people up that are around us, to give at a cost to ourselves. And so in Peter's letter, in 1 Peter, he's talking directly to Christians and he's saying and encouraging and pleading that Christians would bank their lives on the fact that God makes promises and he keeps all of his promises. He's telling people to live, as, um, to live a part of this kingdom, this kingdom that we've been speaking about over the past five weeks, this kingdom that doesn't fade, this kingdom that's completely unshakable um, and it never, ever ends. You see, Peter knew Jesus intimately. He had a a closeness and a relationship with Jesus. And as a result of that relationship, he learned humility. And he knew that the two were closely connected. And so he encourages all of us to have this rock-solid view of God that will lead us to become more humble in a way that the other kingdoms of this world cannot imitate. Let's read again the passage in 1 Peter 5, verse 5. Again, I encourage you to go to it. This is what he said. He implored people. He said, all of you, clothe yourselves with humility. Clothe yourselves. Let it be completely all over you so that whoever's looking at you, that's what they see. Clothe yourselves with humility toward one another because God opposes the proud but shows favour to the humble. See, I've always been such a great fan of imagery like this because when I, when I hear imagery like this, it helps me to, to picture that. So as I get up in the morning and I'm getting on my clothes, I'm also thinking, how do I clothe myself in humility right now? In the same way, today I chose to wear a grey top so that as you're looking at me, you see, wow, Josh has got a grey top. Today, I want to wear humility so that when you see me, you see Jesus in me through my actions. You know, if I think of my own life, I know that since getting married to Sam Lola, it's been three and a half years now that we've been married. And I can say honestly that I experience daily opportunity after opportunity to choose either pride, to choose for pride or humility to be nurtured and to be cultivated in my life. You know, there's never been a better training ground than families and friendships and workplaces and, and marriages where this can be cultivated. You see, God uses these places to prune and to refine us and to teach us. It might be hard. It might be stressful. It might take 
you know, having a good hard look at ourselves, but God uses these to cultivate and to prune and to nurture, a lot like a garden. And so staying humble before God as people that regularly mess up, that people that regularly get it wrong, will ultimately lead to being humble and humility in our relationships with other people. And so in a very practical sense, I know it's hard to simply like switch on humility. It's not like, you know, I can, I can put on this top, but you can't, it's a bit harder to kind of think, all right, how do, I, how do I just choose to be humble, you know, right now? Well, you see, I believe that, that humility is cultivated through service, that it's in the way that we lift other people up and give and the way that we serve, that's how humility ends up being cultivated inside of us. And so as we, as you and I, seek to be intentional and seek to choose a life marked with service to the people around us, and that's whether it's noticed, whether people see it or whether they don't, it doesn't matter. If we choose to live a life of service, then slowly and steadily we begin to change and the Holy Spirit works within us so that we, we are changed on the inside out in a very real and in a very deep sense. And soon, as we live like that, we find that, that now instead of becoming defensive and instead of looking to put others down, instead our life starts to look a bit different. All of a sudden as we do that, you know, things that our own shortcomings, we're, we're a lot maybe you know, able to kind of acknowledge those. We're, we're a lot more willing to kind of acknowledge our own mistakes and, 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 you know, when brought to light. All of a sudden, the life of humility means that now we can begin to forgive other people in the same way that God has forgiven us. Humility means that we can be vulnerable when normally our default is to be defensive. And to be honest it, with you guys, that's, that's my own, like, struggle. You know, even in my, like, you know, workplace and marriage and everything like this, you know, my default is always to, to be defensive. But that's not good. That's not where God, that's not God's best for my life. God's wanting to, you know, prune and work that out and create more humility um, in me because defensiveness is that obsession again with self-preservation. But that's not, there's no space for that in the kingdom of God. And so as we all seek to live a life of giving and service, we clothe ourselves in humility. We clothe ourselves in a way that wherever we are in the world, whoever we're meeting, whether that's we're with family, we're with friends, we're with our boss or, or our colleagues or, or the person at the checkout, whoever it is, they see humility. It's evident and it flows through every interaction, every conversation. That's what it means to clothe yourself with humility. Spurgeon, C.H. Spurgeon said this when talking about what it means to clothe yourself in humility, for it to be a part of everything. He said this, he said, true humility is like a flower that will adorn any garden. It's the source with which you can season every dish of life and you'll find an improvement in every case. Whether it's prayer or praise, whether it's work or suffering, the genuine salt of humility cannot be used in excess. See, in God's kingdom, humility is not weakness, but is strength. Humility is not oppressive, it's empowering. When we find that we have the ability to throw off the opinions of the world, we can then be released to live and, and live through life exactly the way that God had for us. And so as we do this, we bring glory to God and, and we enrich the lives of the people around us and we experience that peace and that joy and that goodness that comes from God. And obviously, let's be honest, this isn't a one-time thing, but it's a lifetime of cultivating and nurturing and growing. And so even today, why not just ask God? And just ask God and say, God, would you, would you nurture humility in my life? Make me like a garden, God. Remove the weeds of pride Remove the weeds of self-righteousness. And instead, God, would you plant humility? Would you grow this garden within me?